In this video, we're going to be talking about how to evaluate a surface integral. And in this particular problem, we've been asked to find the surface integral of the function x squared z plus y squared z ds, where s is the hemisphere given by the equation x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 4, and by the inequality z greater than or equal to 0. So the first thing we want to realize is that our equation here that defines s is x squared plus y squared plus z squared, which is the standard equation of a sphere where the square of the right-hand side over here is the radius. So normally if we just looked at this equation on its own, we'd have the equation of a sphere in three-dimensional space centered at the origin with radius 2. But we've also been told that z has to be greater than or equal to 0. That means that we're only dealing with the half of the sphere that lies on or above the xy coordinate plane. So if we just take a moment to draw our surface in three-dimensional coordinate space, we can draw our coordinate axes here where we have x, y, and z. And really we're just talking about the half sphere. So it's like a dome where the bottom of the dome is sitting on the xy coordinate plane. So if we have this sort of half dome like this and we show the bottom here and the bottom is sitting on the xy coordinate plane like this so the dome is going to be centered at the origin because this is the top half of the sphere centered at the origin so it's going to look something like this and we know that the distance here from the origin the center of the base of the dome to anywhere inside it so if we go straight up or if we go in this direction or out in this direction we're going to have the same radius everywhere and that radius no matter which way we go that radius is equal to 2 because we know that the radius of the sphere is the square root of 4 which is 2 so the radius here of our dome is going to be equal to 2. Now I have here the formula that we're going to be using to find the surface integral. It's just the double integral of the function that we were given here, which is a function f defined in terms of x, y, and z. And then we're going to have this square root value. So evaluating a surface integral is all about just finding the values we need for this formula and plugging them in. So we can see right off the bat that we're going to need the partial derivative of z with respect to x and the partial derivative of z with respect to y. Well, we don't have a function yet in terms of z. The only function we could put in terms of z is this one right here. So if we go ahead and try to solve this for z, we'll get z squared is equal to 4 minus x squared minus y squared when we subtract x squared and y squared from both sides. Now we don't want to solve for z by dividing through by z because that'll mess us up. So what we want to do to find the partial derivatives of z with respect to x and y is actually use implicit differentiation and take the derivatives of both sides and then try to solve for this partial derivative of z with respect to x. So let's go ahead and use implicit differentiation to take the partial derivative of z with respect to x. When we do that, we're going to be taking the derivatives of z and x, but we're going to treat y as a constant. So on the left-hand side over here, we're going to get 2z because the derivative of z squared is 2z, but we're treating z as a function, x is the variable and y is a constant. We're treating z as a function, so when we take the derivative, we have to multiply by the derivative of z with respect to x, the derivative of the function z with respect to the variable x. Then over here on the right hand side, the derivative of 4, any constant, is 0. The derivative of negative x squared is negative 2x. And the derivative of negative y squared is just 0 because we treat y as a constant. So now to solve for this, we're going to get partial derivative of z with respect to x. We're going to divide both sides by 2z and we get negative 2x over 2z. And when we cancel out our 2s, we get negative x over z as the value for the partial derivative of z with respect to x. Now we can go ahead and do the same thing for the partial derivative of z with respect to y. We'll start again with this equation, but we'll take the derivative of the function z with respect to y, which means we'll treat z as a function, y as the variable, and x as a constant. So using implicit differentiation, again we're going to get 2z but then we have to multiply, since z is a function, we have to multiply by partial z partial y. That's going to be equal to, 4 goes away because it's a constant, so the derivative is 0. x is a constant, so the derivative of negative x squared is 0. And then the derivative of negative y squared is negative 2y. 
Dividing both sides by 2z, we get the partial derivative of z with respect to y is equal to negative 2y over 2z, and canceling out our 2s, we get negative y over z. So now we have the partial derivatives that we need to plug into the square root inside of our surface integral formula. The only other part of this integral is this f of x, y, g of x, y. Well, g of x, y is basically a placeholder for z, right? This is a function in terms of x, y, and z. So it's f of x, y, z. And all we would normally do is we would take this equation, we would solve it for z. So when we got to this point, we would take the square root of both sides to find an equation for z, and we would plug that in for g of x, y. However, before we do that, I always like to plug in my partial derivatives with respect to x and y into my square root to see if I can simplify and pull out the x, because if it's not necessary, Necessary for me to plug g of x, y into this function here, then I'll save myself some steps if I can cancel some things out. So let's go ahead and try to evaluate our integral. We're going to get the double integral here, and we're going to deal in a minute with this d and dA right here. For now, we're just going to say the double integral of f of x, y, g of x, y. In other words, just this function that we were given here. So we have x squared z plus y squared z. And then we're going to multiply here by the square root of 1 plus the partial derivative of z with respect to x, which we know to be negative x over z. When we square that according to our formula, the negative sign will drop away and we'll just have x squared over z squared. So x squared over z squared. We're going to get the same thing here when we square the partial derivative of z with respect to y, and we're going to end up with plus y squared over z squared, and then we have our dA over here on the end. Now in order to simplify our square root, what we need to do is find a common denominator. These second two fractions, the x squared over z squared and the y squared over z squared, share a common denominator of z squared. So we need this 1 instead of 1 to be z squared over z squared. Now we can find this common denominator and our square root ends up being x squared plus y squared plus z squared in the numerator divided by z squared in the denominator. And we have, of course, dA x squared z plus y squared z. And we should have this in parentheses here because this is a sum and we need to know that we're multiplying the whole thing by the square root. Okay, so now we've simplified the square root somewhat. Remember that when we have the square root of a rational function, a fraction like this, we can take the square root of the numerator and denominator separately. The numerator is pretty gnarly, but the denominator is just z squared, and the square root of z squared is z. So pulling that out, what we get is the integral here, d, so we have x squared z plus y squared z, and then we pull out the z, so we multiply by 1 over z, because this z squared was in the denominator, so the square root is z, that has to stay in the denominator, times square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared dA. And now we can see, luckily, that we get this z in the denominator to cancel with these two z values here in the numerator, and we're just left with double integral over the region d of x squared plus y squared times the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared dA. Now as a reminder, if we hadn't been able to cancel z everywhere out of this integral, what we would have wanted to do is solve this equation here for z by taking the square root of both sides, and we would have plugged the square root of the right hand side in for z everywhere in our integral. But because we just have this left over, now we can start making some serious substitutions. So notice here that inside our square root, all we have left is x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Well, according to this equation, we already know that that's equal to 4. So we can go ahead and plug 4 in for this x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Of course, the square root of 4 is just 2, so we can pull that out in front, and what we end up with is 2 times the double integral over the region D of x squared plus y squared times dA. 
At this point, we're going to need to convert to polar coordinates in order to go any further with our integral. So remember that when we convert from Cartesian coordinates to polar coordinates, we use these three conversion formulas. We know that x squared plus y squared is equal to r squared. We know that x equals r cosine theta and that y equals r sine theta. What we can see is that inside our integral here, we have x squared plus y squared. We know that that's equal to r squared, so we'll get 2 times the double integral of r squared. And whenever we convert from Cartesian coordinates to polar coordinates, we always convert this dA to r dr d theta. So we put that in. Remember in polar coordinates you'll have everything in terms of r and theta. So already our integral is looking good because we have r and theta and nothing else. All we need now is limits of integration. Because we put dr and d theta and dr is on the inside, we know that the limits of integration on this inside integral have to be with respect to r. Well, what's the domain of r when it comes to this hemisphere that we're talking about that we drew in three-dimensional coordinate space? Well, we already said that r was equal to 2. The distance from the origin to the outer edge of the sphere anywhere is going to be 2. The smallest distance that r can be is 0 because r represents a radius in three-dimensional space. We can't have a negative radius. Our figure wouldn't exist. So r has to be between 0 and 2. So we'll go ahead and say that this integral is going to be from 0 to 2. And again, we put these on the inner integral because we have dr on the inside. We have d theta on the outside, so we want to put our limits of integration for theta on the outer integral. And our limits of integration for theta are going to be 0 to 2 pi, because remember that theta is the angle between the positive direction of the x-axis and the coordinate point in polar space. So we start here at the angle theta, and we move all the way around in the xy coordinate plane, like this, and when we get all the way back to where we started, we're at an angle theta of 2 pi. So we go all the way from 0 to 2 pi, and so our limits of integration for theta are going to be 0 to 2 pi. If the surface S had been defined, for example, as this exact hemisphere, but it was also just half of this figure, where x was maybe greater than or equal to 0 also, maybe we had been given an additional condition, x greater than or equal to 0, and this surface was just this positive half here, everything sitting on top of this area right here. Well, in that case, theta would have only been from 0 to pi because it would have been half of this 2 pi circle. But because it's the entire dome, 360 degrees, then we know that the limits of integration for theta are going to be 0 to 2 pi. So this doesn't exist in this problem. Now all we need to do is evaluate our integral. Because we have r squared times r, we can call this r cubed instead. And now we want to integrate with respect to r because we have dr on the inside. When we do that, we're going to get 1 fourth r to the 4, and we're going to be evaluating that on the limits of integration r equals 0 to r equals 2. So 0 to 2, we leave our d theta alone, and we have 2 times the integral from 0 to 2 pi. So we leave everything related to theta alone. Now when we plug in our upper limit of integration 2, what we're going to get here is 2 to the 4th, which we know is 16, times 1 fourth is just 4. Subtracting whatever we get when we plug in 0, we plug in 0 and we just get 0 to the 4th is 0 times 1 fourth is 0, so we get a minus 0 and we don't even have to write it. So we have d theta, now we want to integrate with respect to theta. Well, the integral of 4 is just 4 theta. We have this 2 out in front, and we're going to be evaluating on the limits 0 to 2 pi. So if we simplify here, obviously we'll just get 8 times theta on the interval 0 to 2 pi. Plugging in the upper limit of integration, 2 pi, we get 8 times 2 pi is 16 pi. And then subtract from that whatever we get when we plug in 0, but of course we just get 0. So there's no need to write it. And what we see is that the value of the surface integral of this given function over the surface s defined by these equations here is 16 pi.